Hello, everyone, and welcome to Arduino Edovision's second live show. I'm Melissa. I'm from Arduino Education and from Arduino Content Team. And today, we're going to talk about the challenges and opportunities of distance learning and technology. Like last time, last week, I had with me Teresa and Roxana. They're here today, of course. Let me add you guys here. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming, guys. A lot of people writing already in the chat. Great. Yeah, thank Hello, you. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pietro. Hello, and... James. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so today we're going to have a guest. So it's not just three of us, like last time. We're going to have one of the Arduino co-founders, David Cortillas. And Roxana has prepared some questions for David, and they're going to uh, talk about it uh, after after we go through some of the new things that we have the remote learning website. You're going to have an interview with David. And of course, people watching this, you have also the chance to ask your questions from David. So you can write your questions in the chat. And after Roxana's interview, he's going to have some time to answer to your questions. We're going to start this live by explaining some of the new things that we have the remote learning website uh go through david's interview after that uh we're gonna go and dig deeper kind of like what are the things that students are actually struggling with now that they're working from home and we have all prepared uh our own project to one kind of solution to answer to those struggles that they have and we're gonna present our projects to you and maybe you have actually created your own solutions. So we would like to hear something about that too. And don't forget to have your phone close to you. We're going to have a quiz this time again. So listen carefully. Exactly. And as last time you have the chat, please tell us where you're from, if you're educators or parents and what you teach, especially. We will try to answer to all of your questions as much as we can. And some of them we will also bring here live in the studio. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> nice to see that there's some people that were here last week too. Yep. Uh, I would like to hear where you're from. Like uh, I, We said it out already last week, but I'm from Finland. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Sweden. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Mexico City, and Melissa, she said she works uh, in the content team. And the yes. rest of the ones that uh, they join for the first time. The rest is from oh. the Yeah, <laughs> I work uh, mainly with educational support. Yeah. And I do online and on-site training for our educational partners, so. Great. Oh, we have people from India, Denmark, Philippines. Nice. Oh, kind of all over the world. Teachers from India, great. There's Italy. Pietro. Maybe some people know we have an uh, office in Italy. Qatar, wow, Germany. Oh. Malaysia. Great. That's awesome. Oh. Oh, United States, yeah. It's a bit different time there. I guess you just woke up. <laughs> this is a good a good way to start your morning. Have a coffee and watch our live show. Okay. Sorry, we were muted for a while. Melissa, you were also muted, I think. Yep. Can you unmute? I think we were un accidentally muted. Hello, I'm okay. a parent from the West Coast in the US. Thank you, Steve, for joining. Many people from the US, nice. Canada, great. OK. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, we can hear you now, Melissa. Yes. OK. Was I gone for long? No. <laughs> Nothing important, I guess. Okay, so uh, I can show you a bit of what we have on our remote learning site. So uh, arduino.cc slash remote learning. So if you haven't visited that site yet, go there after this show. Uh, we Every week we add new, uh, new stuff there. So let me share my screen here. 
So this is the site, and as you can see, it's last updated. Actually, we just updated it before this live session, so we need to update that date there. Uh, here you can see the video tutorial that uh, we're creating for you guys every week. We have new two new videos here, so set up your tools. You can watch this video while you're waiting for your starter kit to arrive. Uh, it's for installing IDE on your computer and getting ready for the first project. And then we have the video for the first project. So when you have your starter kit and all the components, you can start building the projects. And actually, this your first circuit, Teres is our star in this video. And she's guiding you through the project, how to create the circuit. Hi, everyone. I'm Teres. So after this live session, you can go and uh, watch our videos if you have already a started kit. Uh, here you can sign up for the for the live sessions, like some of you did, I, I'm sure. Uh, we have two new guides here, so for parents and uh, nine ways to engage and teach children remotely. Go check them out. And like last time, we mentioned this, but at the bottom of the page, we have this contact form that you can use. Here, you can leave questions for us. Uh, we're gonna have some of the questions here, but you can also suggest that what would you like to see and hear during these live sessions, or if you want to be guest yourself. Uh, and Therese is the one who's going through all the, all the questions that you sent through this contact form. Mm. Actually last week, or since last week, we had a few questions through the form. There was one that we can maybe talk about. We had Kathy B who asked us through the form, my daughter is seven, is there any training for a student her age? So the Arduino starter kit that we talk about here is, was mainly developed for maybe, I would say 14 years old or younger if you're, like, if you're able to. Seven is a bit too young, I would say. Um, maybe if you're a parent and you can do the starter kit yourself, your kid can sit next to you and you can show them what you're doing. Otherwise, we don't have anything that is targeted to primary school. But I would say that we have the science kit, for example, that is targeted to a bit younger audience. I think it's 11. Um, but that one doesn't require any coding. So if you're a parent and you have time, you can use the science kit to sit with your kid. It teaches you about science such as physics and magnetism uh, so it's not really about coding and programming but that's an option if you you're a parent and you have a younger kid yeah definitely the science kids uh is an easy way you can you get an arduino board and you can do different kind of experiments we have an online platform where you have all the experiments all the assemblies how to do the instruction for that but you don't have to do any coding or you don't have to do wiring so i think it's a safe way to start with that yeah. So if you have any questions regarding homeschooling or Arduino, please use the form. We can bring them up in the next episode or type them here in the chat. Mm -hmm. OK, so I think it's back to you, Melissa. Yeah, uh, I was uh, I was looking at some of the comments here. There's a lot of people, uh, some that I recognize from from last week, but also I saw, yeah, there's Layla. Hi, nice to see you. Uh -huh. uh, and we have here, there, I, I was thinking if there's any questions that you have now in the chat that you want, uh, want to ask about the remote learning website, we have now a chance to answer here, here in live. If you have, is there someone who already purchased their starter kit or started to go through the training videos? I would like to hear hear your comments if there is someone. Is John Michael Santiago. I think he is from Spain, right? So he's asking if the Arduino education kits can be used for competitions. Well, actually, uh, we have or you we used to have this this kit like CPC one hundred one, and. Uh, what they did mainly in Spain because it was, we ran this in, in Spain like for four years or the last year we also ran it in many schools in Spain. What they did after they gone through the platform and the project, 
they have a tech, on, a tech fair where the students showcase their projects. And the students, we have like thousands of students attending to the fair, showing what they, their creations after they went to the platform, the things they learned. And then we have some Arduino stickers, and they voted for their favorite project. And yeah, so it's a really good way to engage the students and show what they did. So that's what we are uh, used in the past, the CPC 101 kit for not competitions, but more like a technological first. Uh, but probably for we can also do that for other of our products like CPC Go, uh, to replicate this kind of technological first uh, schools can do that also. So you as a teacher also can suggest that to your school. When things back to normal, hopefully soon, uh, the students go through the CTC Go, for example, they did their projects and then uh, they can have a tech fair when they can showcase the projects they did. So yes, it's possible to do that. Yeah, and I know that a lot of schools might have their, like for their classes, they have created their own tech fairs at the school. Mm -hmm. uh, with the components that they have, uh, having the different like tasks based on what their students are interested. In. Yeah, and, and actually also what, what we want to do here in this, uh, during the remote, our initiative, the remote learning, is also to have a, a competition, but we, we are finishing that. So of course we'll let you know what we're planning to do with that, to have like an online challenge competition. So they yeah. do that. Uh, we can answer to this. Uh, there's someone who has started a kit from 2015. What is the difference with the new kit? The kit is uh, basically the same. Uh, I think they have made some changes of it, like how it looks. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's mainly design changes. Yeah. The cover looks different. The boxes look a bit different, but otherwise it's the same. Yeah. And now we have uh, what we didn't have in 2015. We have the uh, fundamental certification that we didn't have before. So that's a uh, one way to kind of test your knowledge or certify your knowledge, uh, what you learn from the circuit, but also the new thing that we're adding are the training videos. So students that are working from home, studying at home, they can go through and watch these training videos that they're going to help them to go through the project in the circuit. So that's that's what we're adding to the, the exactly. kit. So yeah. regardless of which like version you have, if you have an old one or a new one, you will be able to use our videos and follow them. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I think, Rox, we are ready for your interview with David. Yes, we are. So, okay. Yeah, we, we had a, a longer interview with David yesterday. We're going to edit it and then publish it so you can see the whole thing. But we also have David here live. And I will ask him some questions uh, relating like the education, uh, the remote learning, and also you can ask him questions. So let's bring David. Hello. Hey, he Hello, how's it going? Good, thank you for being here today. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks. So guys, if you're ready with your questions, but I'm going to ask David uh, some of them. So if you are ready, let's get started. So can we please take a look at your remote working setup <laughs> <laughs> okay i prepare myself for this so I, i'm using a movable camera so i will take my camera and move it around the table okay look at this <laughs> so i i actually teach online all the time <clears throat> i used to teach online before covid19 but i'm you know now i'm teaching even more so i have a laptop and i use my laptop for uh talking to my students and then I have an external screen <laughs> that I use for different things. Like uh, this is my software, the university where I teach, where we follow people's, uh, it's a learning management system. We follow people's uh, performance. And I have a second screen, this one here, actually third one. And it's this one screen for uh, for when I am uh, having video conferences with like 20 students. So I can continue to do the same things. And I have the faces here so I can follow people and the code on my normal laptop and data sheets or whatever up there. And then, well, this is my desk and uh, you see I got myself a pretty nice microphone. <clears throat> and uh, it's because I uh, I uh, speak so many hours and when you're wearing headphones all the time, I can hear myself. <laughs> so, uh, so I got myself a microphone so I can listen to what I'm, 
to what I'm saying when I'm saying it, so I can modulate my voice a little bit. Yeah. And then I have like uh, different boards in the desk, like uh, an OBLE uh, 101 board and uh, some Arduino prototypes here for maker boards. Um, and, you know, I always have some books. This one is actually about doing creative projects with uh, microcontrollers. And of course, uh, never fails like a good old school computer game. So yeah, so this is my workspace uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as I said, it's not very different from the one I will have at the university. Maybe the big difference is that that's there. I have like a four and a half meters long shelf with a lot of books. Yeah. So uh, it's a bit more comfortable. <laughs> so now that you were talking about boards, I was wondering which, what, what board is your favorite? <laughs> Oof, I'm a really old school guy, so, uh, <laughs> okay. I have here one of the really old ones. This is the, the Achimila, okay. It was commemorating that we had made 10,000 boards and wow. it does, still has like the map of Italy on the back, you see? And the seal port number was made with a paper sticker, you see there? Yeah. Um, no, but uh, to be honest, uh, right now I'm, I'm very much like in the nano BLE sense that has a lot of sensors on the board and it's a great thing for the price. Um, when dealing with more like education with younger kids, I, I like the Wi-Fi Revision 2 that has Wi-Fi Bluetooth and, and it's very sturdy, like the big form factor that I think is convenient for some type of students still. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Now you know which is... David's favorite board. <laughs> so now let's move to more like the educational part of the conversation. So first I want to ask you how this pandemic has changed the routine. Oh yeah. <clears throat> but, well, um, as I said, I, I, I do a lot of online teaching already, but probably the main difference is that the students aren't used to it. <laughs> you know, it's like one thing is that you make an online class to somebody that's ready to take an online class. The different thing is that everybody is forced to go home and suddenly study from home. So my routine starts with asking people about their well-being. Like, how are you doing is the first question, but it's obviously an honest question. I try to understand whether the students need any help, uh, whether they need any support, and whether we can provide this to them in any way. And after that, we jump into the teaching. And the teaching is very different. It's a different rhythm. Um, so I try to meet the students more often and shorter times. At the university, I will have four or five hours long lab sessions. Now that we're doing them online, I typically cut them to maximum two hours and with a break in between to make sure everybody gets time, everybody you know gets to stretch a little bit and also they get to think a bit about what I'm saying because since there is no direct interaction, um, sometimes uh, you miss this like being able of like cracking a joke because somebody is saying something and drifting into a different conversation that you will do in a normal lab. But if you're in an online session, it's really hard. And especially if you record the session for people to follow it later, you have to have a bit of a different attitude because that day-to-day -day jokes make no sense when you watch the thing recorded, right? So, so the rhythm, well-being, and all of these aspects start to play a much bigger role. Yeah, that's important. So we, well, I know that you, that you have a 12-year-old daughter so you're not also you're not only an engineer and a parent, but you're also a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I was a student until last year as well. <laughs> so, so I had this like multi multi faceted role in my life, very complicated. Yeah. So I, I was wondering uh, if your daughter is into programming and coding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Um, she very much is. I mean, I would say she she does have the skill. Um, it's not something that she likes to do in, the, in her spare time. She does it at school. It's a normal thing at her school. Um, but she definitely likes it. After that, we started really early on when she was like three years old. Uh, she already understood how things worked. I mean, she couldn't read, but but she understood the principles of causality. Like if you do this, then this happens sequentiality, like, you know, different things that are important when learning about computer science. Yeah. So then how do you think learning this at a very young age has helped her in developing uh, her skills? 
<laughs> okay, this is an opinion, uh, but I think it's uh, I think it's definitely helping. You know, obviously, if, if you have somebody in your context that is bringing these tools to you and you're exposed and you know they exist, it doesn't take you by surprise. So when you start learning, you already know the basic lingo and you know how it goes. And that's very, very important. And there's actually a pretty good report on this topic about the a woman in the 80s that wanted to start uh, studying computer science and all of the other kids had had computers home. So she felt uh, behind. So I think it's very important to at least uh, expose people to, to the language. So when they make a decision in their life, whether they want to continue with technology or not, they don't feel behind because they were not exposed at the right time. So that's what we try to do here at home, at least. So we don't force our kid to study anything. She can do whatever she wants, but at least she gets to see things. Yeah. So um, then you're an engineer, a parent, and also a teacher, right? So for how long have you been teaching? Yeah, I was teaching since I was 14 years old. Uh, I started <laughs> with after school classes. I made it into a small business when I was at university. And when I finished, I really wanted to become a university teacher. Uh, but they kind of kicked me out to be trying the world. My professors realized I was very much of like an academic. And they told me you should go out and try the real world. And so I did, but it didn't last very long. Two years later, I was applying for a teacher job at the university in Sweden. And that's 20 years ago. So I've been teaching for 20 years now at the university, at least. Uh -huh. what, what university did you do? Malmo University in Sweden. What is the course that you're teaching now? Well, I'm teaching interaction design. And this is very related to, in my case, technologies for for designing new appliances, products, and services. Mm -hmm. And so I um, I learn about embedded technology, and then I teach about it, of course, programming, uh, carpentry, uh, digital manufacturing, uh, model making, design in general, and uh, also art installations. Mm -hmm. So as, as a parent, as a teacher, and also as a tech savvy, what are your concerns <laughs> Uh, for on your educations and your students daughter now with the pandemic? Well, yeah, as I said, one of my main concerns is about people's well-being. Um, uh, and technology can be very challenging sometimes if you don't have the right mentorship and you don't have the right approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it can be very complex. Um, because, of course, if you don't have somebody to support you, it can be frustrating. And, and you, you need to, first of all, you need to have the right learning pace mm -hmm. like certain dose on a periodic time until you get very engaged and and you build an understanding that will get you to fly so to say right like this book i have here on my desk this is a fantastic book to say right this one uh but i wouldn't recommend this to a first year engineering student you know mm -hmm. so you need to you need to 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 know some stuff and actually you also need to know something about music before you can start working with this book so as a teacher, my role really is if I identify, some, identify somebody that's interested in this kind of topic, guide this person to the moment they can make it to this book and then give them the book. And that, that's a very complex thing to do when you're on distance. Yeah. You know, when you're face to face and you meet people, you meet people beyond just the class. You meet them at the cafeteria, you have a cup of coffee, you discuss things, you get to know about their interest. Oh, this guy like, likes music. So maybe I can guide this person to that towards these kind of projects. But suddenly when you are in this online context, we, we're still learning how to deal with it. So we don't necessarily know about the social uh, interests of people and, and how we can develop that into our, into our teaching. And that's very important. And um, so I was actually this morning reading a, an interview with the, the president of the OECD. And he was talking about this exact same thing like when kids come to school, when students go to university, they share a social space and they both shape the space and they shape themselves to the space and to the context and the others. And uh, when you are at, uh, at home, uh, that's, that space is not visible. And, and so the others don't shape you the same way. You don't live behind your home, your problems at home. So you are not at this equalizer space any longer. 
And so we need to learn how to incorporate that in our work, both teachers and uh, school and universities as well. Yeah, that's a super interesting point. So, and, and also now that we're, of course, talking about digital learning, do you think that we will be at this point where digital learning will be comparable to traditional learning or even a better experience? I think, I think they are complementary. Uh, they have overlaps, obviously, and right now, digital learning is taking over everything in some places, at least for a while. But there are some things that are very interesting to do when you are on a digital sphere and you're on distance that are hard to explain when you are not on distance. For example, I, I just had a case just half an hour ago, I was talking to some students who are building a system to help them communicate with one another because of the COVID-19 and they have to be home and they want to send themselves like so, some social knacks every now and then. Like mm -hmm. I touch here and then a light shines up at the other side. Well, these students four weeks ago, they didn't know how to program anything. Mm -hmm. And now they're building physical models that communicate through the internet and they share things with one another. You know, having the challenge of being on distance has helped them making this very interesting project in record time, starting with zero knowledge that they started. So uh, that's an advantage. You know, how digital technology allowed us to do this. Otherwise, they would probably be reading books. I would be sending them snail mail, telling them, please read chapter three, you know. Mm -hmm. But in, in this case, we can build an entirely different scenario for educating. And that's very important. So technology now allows doing this. Five years ago, we have been much more complicated kind of thing. So then how you see right now the role of educators and parents? Yeah, well, right now the parents, well, okay, again, it's an age, it's an age problem. <laughs> when, when kids are at university, then it's, you know, parents' role is important, but not as strong. Mm -hmm. But when you are 10 years old, 12 years old, your parents have to be there to support you quite a bit. Uh, and especially now that you're going back home, parents, they need to play a role. They need to help the kids uh, develop a sense of uh, seriousness around it because home has always been the place where you relax and you take it easy. And now suddenly it's a place where you have to actually do some work. So you need to build it somehow physically or time-based, transform the room into a different space, uh, allow the kid to, to take the time that he or she needs to get mentally prepared and you know run the class, make sure that things are done um, and make sure the kid doesn't get stressed and actually communicate a lot to the teacher about the possible problems you might find. Because we as parents, we don't necessarily can know everything. I know my daughter is learning French. I cannot say a word in French, but if I have an issue, I will send an email to the teacher and tell her, hey, I, we found this issue. Can you help us out? What shall we do? And I think that's very important. If parents, they need to be more aware of what's going on, not because they need to be um, uh, monitorizing the teacher is more because they need to figure out how they can help the teacher provide their kids the best service possible. Yeah. So what do you think in this case like physical computing Arduino could help us to bring better education like digital education to more kids, to more children, to more students? Yeah, well, when, when we started with Arduino, we used to say one, one man, one board, you know, like paraphrasing Mandela with one man, one boat. And uh, we, I mean, we used to say to it as a, there is, there is this idea of accessibility as a democratic right, um, you know, accessibility to the tools, accessibility to the software, accessibility to the computers, to the connection, to basic, to basic things that you should have, water, food, etc. right? Well, if you want to learn digital electronics, you should have accessibility to the tools that correspond to that field. And microcontrollers play a super big role in our present life and our future life. They are, they are there embedded into everything. And um, so consider how very little they cost. Why should students not get access to one each? That's always been our 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 sentence, right? Mm -hmm. So, but then when we build Arduino education, we realized 
uh, or we built it based on, on conversations with teachers, we realized that the, the social aspect was very important in our teaching. And, and we had to incorporate project-based learning as a basic underlying idea. So we started to, to build the, the teamwork as a very important part and remove technology to enhance the social aspects, right? Mm -hmm. But now that we are in this situation, I think we need to move back to, to uh, use technology to fill in the gap that separation is provoking. So having trustworthy, uh, low-cost tools is definitely a way to ensure that everybody can get access. Okay. Nice point. So, two more questions. <laughs> One, wh what advice can you give parents, students, and, and teachers right now during this situation? Well, uh, my main advice is always patience. You know, um, some days are going to be real tough, uh, given the circumstances. So, uh, you know, we have to all get used to it. But the good news is there is light at the end of the tunnel. So it's, it's about trusting on science and then waiting a little bit and making the best out of this time. So uh, I have friends that are becoming great at board games, I have friends that are going back to read books. Um, I'm volunteering in a collective working with COVID-19 on distance. Uh, so there is time to do a lot of stuff and we should, you know, try to get the best out of the situation. And when it comes to learning and teaching, I think patience is the best thing. Yeah. The best thing to recommend, I mean, you know, and and uh, and keep the channel open is my second advice. Like communicate back to your teachers uh, as parents and as, as teachers communicate back to the parents and also monitor the students. Uh, because unfortunately we can't see them um, as we did before. And last question, now that you're talking about well, maybe not in your case, having more time. <laughs> How are you hooked on right now? What are you looking, watching on TV? Yeah, well, with a very few hours there is left in my days. Yeah. We, we've been watching Tiger King, I guess, like everybody else in this uh, in the Western <laughs> Hemisphere, you know. Um, uh, and and then actually, with my daughter, we share a, a taste for really bad police TV series, nice. like Brooklyn Nine Nine or. Uh, uh, medical doctors, no, medical police is called. Medical police is the next really bad TV series that we love because it's so bad that it's fun. Yeah. yeah. Also good to dis the disconnect. So yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. So it's, I think it's important to find small things that help you, you know, disconnect from the from the day because it might seem that it's not stressful uh, because with your home, you know, you basically wake up. You know, do your chores and then you don't have to spend one hour commuting. You basically go to the computer and you start working. But, you know, uh, being out really helps. Getting fresh air really helps. And not getting it in the same degree at the same degree you were getting it before is a bit of a, an issue. So you have to figure out what works for you. So thank you so much, David, for your time. And now people can ask questions if they already have questions for David, now it's the time to do it. So let's check the chat if we have some questions there. Therese or Carla, do you have any questions for David? We have some questions for David, yes. Um, let's see. We have one that says, David, during your lessons in remote, all the students have all the necessary hardware at home. Are there situations where they don't have it? And is there any software that simulates Arduino? Oh, there we have it. Perfect. OK. Uh, well, <clears throat> some some uh, projects around do Arduino Uno simulation, which is one of our uh, older, older boards that is used massively in education. Um, in this last time, I'm focusing on doing a lot more experimental teaching for two reasons. Uh, one is that I want to introduce new tools in the teaching. I want to see how it feels to work with, with new things with more sensors. That's why I like the Nano BLE Sense quite a bit because it has accelerometer, microphone, color sensor. So there's a lot you can do out of that. Uh, the thing with that board is that it includes so many things on itself that basically adding a couple of buttons and a motor you are, you are covered for a class. 
So it's easy to ask the students to have everything. Uh, when it comes to other situations, like for example, um, teaching in a, let's say, more complex scenario where, where uh, there might not be enough material for the kids. Uh, I think it's a very challenging situation because most likely there would also not be a very good internet connection for the kids. Mm -hmm. So all of these simulators, they work online. So that's, that's really the issue. Uh, so that's why we focus on making very cheap uh, onboarding systems. Like for example, if you have, if you have a small budget and you have, uh, I don't know, 30 students class, maybe you should get uh, nano every board because in a pack of six, it costs a fraction of, of other boards. And you can make sure everybody has one, so it's easier to do the class than trying to have a simulator that might or might not work, depending on connectivity. So I, I'm really concerned about the connectivity aspect. Uh, I've always been, because I teach all over the world, and uh, in some places, connectivity is still a problem. So you have to find the balance. So to this question is, yes, there are simulators, <laughs> but the question is whether the simulator will be the solution if connectivity is available. Mm. Okay, thanks for that answer, David. Um, we have one more, which is from Sarika. And Sarika is asking, how do you feel that Arduino is very popular among the kids, but many clones are available in the market? <laughs> well, what can I say? Well, we made it open source and uh, uh, that definitely helped spreading in places where uh, we could not reach at the time. So, so I mean, I mean, I think it's great people can get access where we can't reach. You know, on the other hand, if you can't support the project, uh, I think I would be appreciated, especially in this time where things are not that easy for anybody. But you know, as I said earlier, accessibility is first, and then everything else. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we have a last one. I think this is a follow-up question from the previous one from Jan Miguel Santiago. Hi, David. Here in the Philippines, internet connection is really a change. Not all students has an access, especially to those in the remote areas. What can you advise on this? Yeah, that's, that's exactly my point. So mm -hmm. uh, if connectivity is an issue, then you can totally send like the whole Arduino class in a USB stick uh, and work offline. And then ask the students to send you an email every now and then with their advancements. So it's possible to record everything on video and you can put a full course in the cheapest uh, $3 USB stick, uh, software included, you know? So so I think the tools are there to make uh, the, the transfer of information very cheap, even in the worst conditions. Of course, that gives you an asymmetric teaching mechanism. Of course, it's not optimal. Of course, it's even worse than online versus face to face, but it's at least something. So the fact that tools can work when offline and completely disconnected from the internet is an advantage for situations like this one. So yeah, that's always been our goal at Arduino, by the way, to make sure everybody can get access. Okay, great. Um... We have a last one from Jens Mölkard, which is, do you publish any projects that your students have made or are they to be found somewhere? Maybe have some concrete examples from your guidance to teach students? Well, I, I work at a public university besides working at Arduino. And uh, we used to have a very open way to find our projects <laughs> uh, until we changed to this complicated LMS from Norway. Um, but uh, one of my colleagues is making a, a summary of the best projects on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, I, I can find the website and uh, put it on the comments later on. So, so yeah, we, we publish some results of the interaction design students at Malmo University. And we have a, a record that goes back quite some many years. Uh, on the other hand, if there is an interest on concrete examples on, on how we teach, uh, I'm pretty sure that the Edivision project will be glad to to run a session in the future on this topic, and we could, you know, run a more specific class about teaching at university or some, something like that. Uh, since today we made a more general 
a more general one. Okay. Thanks a lot, David. Uh, this was all for David's part. Uh, we might hear from you later, but now it's back to Rox and Melissa. Thank you, David. Hey, hey. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, David. Thank you for your questions. A lot of great questions. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Rox had a longer interview with David. Uh, we're going to publish it later as a podcast or video. We'll see. Uh, it, it was around 40 minutes, you said? Yeah, something like that. So you can check that later on. We discuss a little bit more about education and technology. So, just to yeah. so if you're interested, stay tuned for that. Yeah. We, we also read some articles and uh, looked into the things that students struggle with now if you want to share rocks with some of the oh, sure. you found so from new york times uh they had collected what students had said about the situation now and here we can find some of the quotes uh that we found interesting and if you uh, i can read some of them like it's easier for me to get distracted and be lazy with my work so i'm starting to hate the daily modality of distance learning and i find myself getting distracted much easier and i find myself procrastinating more and more i'm not motivated to complete some work and uh these similar uh answers were repeated so there's uh people get easily distracted it's hard to be productive it's hard to manage your time how much you should use for different tasks uh, and a lot of people are spending uh, the whole day in front of a computer. Like now, uh, usually you talk to someone, you do it there live, but now you have to do it through the computer. So everything you do is through the computer. Uh, maybe you have your homework, you need to do it online. You need to, and you get the task from the teacher, you get it through computer, or maybe you use a phone for that, but you need to look at some screen. Uh, and a lot of the students struggle with the same, uh, that they don't want to be, they, they don't like to be that much in front of a computer. Uh, we also did some research. We went through some other uh, articles. We talked with teachers, we talked with uh, students, and then we found these similar things always repeating themselves. So people have hard time focusing, uh, troubles with time management, lack of motivation, anxiety, and for that, we were thinking that we would like to create some kind of solution, how we can help, because we've noticed the same thing ourselves. Uh, you feel kind of unmotivated. You don't want to be in front of the computer. You want to do something else. So we took, all of us uh, took one project from the starter kit and created our own solution, how we could uh, create something that could help us in this situation. And we can start with your project, with Teresa. Melissa, now you're stuck. Okay, so if you didn't hear, um, we created some projects ourselves based on the starter kit that would help students with different issues they have during their remote learning period. Um, I wanted to regard the issue of lack of concentration or difficulty with time management. So for some students, they have difficulties with either remembering to take breaks or maybe they take breaks too often. As Melissa said, said like sometimes like when they're in school, they always have the teacher or a bell to remind them that now it's the time for the break or now we go back to class. So I used my starter kit to create a small tool I call the study and pause. Um, basically, it's a little lamp indication that reminds you to start studying or to take a five minute break. Um, this one is here. You can set the minutes that you want to study with a potentiometer. Um, it's supposed to be minutes, but I did mine with seconds now, just so that you can see. Let's set it for like a few seconds. So you pause it for, you study for five seconds or five minutes, and then you pause for five minutes, and then you can set whichever time you need. And this was a really, really easy and fast project that I made. Um, it took me 10 minutes, just five or 10 lines of code uses a potentiometer and two LEDs. This is something that you can do at home with your kids as well, um, or your students using the starter kit. 
so this was my project that I made. Uh, what about you guys? I want to hear also, Melissa, you did a yeah. project as well. Yeah. Uh, so for me, uh, usually when I go to work, uh, I I walk to work. So it takes me like 10, 15 minutes to walk to work. Or then I can bike if, I, if I'm there somewhere a bit further. A lot of people, even if they take a bus or a car to work, they still need to walk out from their home, walk to the bus stop or something. But now we don't do that. Now we stay at home and we maybe we take two steps from bed to to our computer or even uh, at school during the classes you have to go from a classroom to another you go to a cafeteria so move around do stuff so i wanted to create something for for that that makes us move let me show you my other camera here so i made uh this is based on starter cube project crystal ball where we learn to use the lcd screen uh, so I tweaked the program only a bit. So I changed what it's supposed to print and I used the random to tell us uh, the amount, the how many, uh, how many we need to do between two and eight and also random what exercise we should do. And when you press the button, it tells us. So we should do all three squats. So I hope all of you at home now too, and there is there in the screen, we should all do now three squats. So go and stand up and do your squats. Rox and Teres too. Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> One. One. <laughs> three. So you don't have to think what you should do. This one tells you how much and, and what you should do. And then you can, I added there actually one thing too. <laughs> So you don't always have to move. Sometimes you can take a piece of chocolate, but then yeah, you can continue. For example, four crunches. And so that is on. great. That is really great. I like that uh, a lot. So it makes it easy for you to do something between classes, for example, or between tasks. Rox, do you wanna show what you did? Sure. So I did this with the help of one of my colleagues at Arduino. So Jose, thank you. <laughs> so we were thinking also, uh, as, as Melissa mentioned before, we read some things that students and teachers are, are struggling with. It's a lack of motivation because you're, you're at the screen the whole time. So it's super hard to focus. So what we were thinking about is having a time management system. This is a little bit more complex. This is based on the crystal ball project on the starter kit and the hourglass project. So it's a mix between them. So we have the LCD screen here. We have, of course, the Uno board. We have the, the tilt sensor here. So here, what we want to do is have, like, as I mentioned, a time management. System. So with here with a button, we set how much time we want to do the project. So I'm going to say one hour. So then I will use the the, the the and then the time starts. So as you can see here, we make this faster to, to show you how it works. So we have the time here on the LCD screen, and we have the LEDs. So we have two visuals here, and also you can have a battery, so you can take this with you while you're doing whatever activity. So building, building this thing, it's also, I think, a motivation for you to do something different because you can use this tool to do your other tasks. And as Melissa was saying uh, before, uh, you don't want to see the computer because you're working uh, with, with it all day. So this will be a nice break. Build something that helps you re uh, solving an issue you're having in your real life. So now time's up. As you, you will see, I have five more minutes or seconds. I have the red LED. And then the piezo will do something here. So then I have a, an audio to let me know that my time is up. So I need to move to do a different thing. So as, as you can see uh, from Teresa's and Melissa's project, with really small things, you can do great ideas, great things. It doesn't need to be complicated, but you can use the starter kit, uh, the components here, to try to improve your life, to make your life easier and also have fun. That's, that's so nice. 
Thanks for showing us, Rock. Thank you. There was so, a question for me. Where uh, where can we find a sample of your project? Uh, at the moment, uh, I don't have it anywhere. Like it's based on the uh, project in StarterKit. So there's a project called Crystal Ball, and it's almost the same. I I switched the tilt uh, switch to a normal switch, so a push, a push button, and then I I changed the code a bit to add the random number for how many how many exercises we should do and then i changed what it should print but i was planning to create a video explaining this uh, and give some ideas so i'm gonna add that to the remote learning site hopefully at the end of this week or next week so then you can of course watch that video mm -hmm. and i know that i'm gonna do that too actually yeah, it was so simple so i can just share it on the remote learning website yeah. We're hoping this serves you as an inspiration. And also we were thinking about publishing this with the code on the on our hashtag, hashtag uh, at home. So you can we will publish this so you can also have access to, to the code and some pictures so hopefully you can learn how to do it and replicate it uh, and do your own and we would love to see yours there. So please please do it. Yes, definitely. If you if you have any project, if you have created your own version of the StartedKit project, or if you have some other components at home, share them. Uh, share those in social media using the hashtag Arduino at home. We would love to see that, and we would love to actually share them here. So, if there's some pictures and videos uh, there, if we can find them from Instagram, for example, we can share some of them here for others others to see too, and on on our learning, a remote learning site too. For sure. Yes. Uh, should you can use have you been uh, paying attention what we say mm -hmm. because i think it's now for okay. our quiz time Yay. at that time we're gonna quiz you on what you've been seeing so far so last week i got some feedback that there is a delay um, not with the game, but with the broadcast. So the broadcast has a small delay while the game hasn't. So I'm gonna try this time to pause for a while before I give away the questions to you on your phone. Uh, let's see how that goes. So everyone, please join the quiz, grab your phone and go to Menti and use the code that is provided at the top, 30, 71 and 04, and you can join this quiz. I want to see as many people as possible. Yes. Yes, you too. Yes, I'm already there. Great. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'll give you a little while. Sorry. Don't worry. I'm there now. Jen, Annie, Jan. Really not wrong. Let's go. Hoda, Jill. Laura, we have a few more seconds, so everyone can join that wants to join. join. Can also have a look. Yes, join, join. Okay, because I think the next page will start the game. Waiting for players. Again, plenty of players, I'm really happy to see that. Yay. Okay, I'm gonna start reading the first question because it will take a uh, while. Yes. So the the code is on the screen. You can you can see that there. Yeah. So menti.com and three zero seven one zero four. Okay. Ready. See that we still have players joining. Yes. Joining great. Okay, let's start. Yeah. So in the beginning, you met David, which is one of our co-founders. Uh, David is currently teaching, and the question is, at what university is David teaching? So now you can go through your phones. So you will get four alternatives. Is it? One of these four. And the faster you answer, the more points you get. So be quick. Hurry, hurry. 
It's Mama University. A lot of you are correct, so I can see that you're listening, or maybe you already knew the before. Uh, moving on, here you will see an image of Melissa's project, the workout project, which was incredible, by the way. Um, it used various components from one of the projects in the project book. And my question is, what is the name of the built-in function that Melissa used to generate all of these exercises? I'm waiting. So vote on your phone now. As you know, we have a lot of built-in functions with Arduino, so you can just use them without having to code the functions yourself. Yeah, I think I should know the answer to this. <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> it is random. This was a bit more tricky, I see, but everyone has a lot to learn. So moving on to the next question. No, there will be a leaderboard. Let's see who's in the first place. Oh, a, new, a lot of new names, I see. It's oh real tight. Yes. Watermelon. It is watermelon with 1,916 points. Now we have only had, I think, two questions. So we have a few more questions left. So everyone who's under watermelon, you still have a chance. Yes. Why am I not right there? I think I answered right. I expect you girls to be there. Um, the next question is, in a really small segment of this live section, David mentioned his the TV show that he's currently watching. So what is the name of the TV show that he's watching? Vote on your phones now. I think this is a tricky one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have a question from the audience. I will reply to you soon, Gregory. It's Tiger King. A lot of Tiger King's watch watchers out there. Um, Gregory is asking, could you tell me the site that you are in right now? I am interested. Um, last week we had it as well, and I explained that this is a site called Mentimeter, um, where you can quiz your students or have polls and just have fun quizzes like this when you're teaching remote Mentimeter. Uh, next question. Okay, you will see an image of my project that I created, which I call the study and pause, where you pause for five minutes after studying for a while. So it has some LEDs and another component. What is the name of the component that I used to set the time? of this study and pause device. Vote now. And the correct answer is potentiometer. There was no transistor or capacitor in this one. Good job. Now we will have a leaderboard. Let's see who is leading. Oh, some changes. Where is it still? Watermelon is still. <laughs> Watermelon is still our fastest contestant with 3,856 points, followed by Pink Unicorn, Adele, and Pietro. Great. In our next question, I will ask you about this little thing that Rox created. Uh, great device, by the way. Um, I'm wondering what this component here in the down left corner what is the name of this component that Rox used? Vote 
Oh, not on your phone. Melissa, are you watermelon? No, I'm not. Uh, I wish. <laughs> we wish. A tilt sensor, sensor is the correct answer. So it works similarly like a, another switch. You just tilt it and the circuit closes. And you can read if it's open or closed. Very handy if you want to incorporate movement with your tools, um, with your projects. And the tilt sensor is also a part of the starter kit. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have a winner. Let's see who that is. Pink unicorn? No? Yes. Oh, there's pink unicorn. Congratulations, pink unicorn. We oh, both asked the question. Yeah. Oh, I want another and Pietro. Plus one more melon. So feel free to share your thoughts on social media. Thank you all for participating. It was really fun having you here. Yeah, and remember that you can use this kind of quiz to. Exactly. So there are multiple tools like this. There are Kahoot. There is Mentimeter. Use whichever you prefer. Um, I like this one for this purpose, but it's up to you. Yeah. Great. Let's move on. I think this was our show uh, for this week. Uh, I think so too. Uh, yeah. We've been here for an hour. Yes. Yeah. So you can still share your comments if there's something that you want to tell us about mm -hmm. remote learning, your tips. And remember to visit our site, arduino.cc slash remote learning. We're gonna publish our training videos there. You can find the useful articles and remember to use the contact form there. You can leave uh, your questions. Uh, we go through some of the questions always here. And also you can have the su su suggestions. I can almost speak. Uh, and then if you want to be one of our guests, here and actually, Rock, if you want to tell our viewers who is going to be our guest next week, yes, we are having a really special guest. Uh, we have an educator from Denmark, so there's something working with you. So we will have him and some of his students, and they were going to share how they're using the starter kit to teaching and learning from home. So, we're also hoping that that serves you as an inspiration and we can learn from each other. So next episode, Jens' name is going to be here as our guest. So don't don't miss that episode next Thursday. Thank you for all of you. Thank you so much for joining and see you next. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.